And thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Tonight we're excited to be presenting the history of our campuses, our North Country campuses, with our very own historian, uh, Tom McGrath. Uh, we would like to thank International Paper of Ticonderoga for their generous support for sponsoring our North Country Live Spring Series. And we have a lot of people joining us this evening. So in an effort to keep the sound quality really good, we ask everyone to please keep uh, you know, your, your, your computers muted during the presentation. If you have any questions, please type them in the chat. And at the very end, time permitting, we will go back and ask a couple of the questions and and hopefully Tom will give us the, the answer. So, so um, I'd like to just thank everybody for joining us again. And without further delay, it's all yours, Tom. Okay. That work, Chris? There we go. There you go. That's it. Right. Super. Technology gets the best of me. So um, let's just see here. There we go. Why? Good question. So. Uh, thank you, Celine, and, and thanks everyone for watching. This is great, great to see uh, a lot of familiar names too. There are um, so many ways to learn about history, but I think one of the best is through making connections to places. Um, let, me, let me throw this out to you. Have you ever read a really good novel or seen a movie or uh, binge watched a series on Netflix, which we're all guilty of this last year, and you get to the end of it and it's almost like um, sort of a bittersweet feeling or an empty feeling because these people didn't exist. These worlds were just made up. Um, Walter White was not a real high school teacher. So one of the really uh, cool things I like about history is you can get um, involved in um, the past in, in different ways and you can read about events and, and literally get to know some of these people. And the good thing is that they were real. And time passes, people come and go, but the places remain. So when you learn about a historical event or a person from the past and you, you, you know, read their writings, you can go to those places. You can walk in their footsteps and uh, it's really powerful. It's almost spiritual in a way. And I started thinking about the campuses that we have here at North Country and, and each one of them is located on a site that has such a unique and rich history. And I thought that might be a good way to approach uh, some presentations here. So we're not talking about the history of North Country, we're talking about the history of the sites before uh, the school occupied them. And tonight we're gonna be looking at Ticonderoga and then I'll be doing moving on to Malone next week. And then hopefully um, not too much longer, we'll be doing a Saranac Lake presentation. So we know that Ticonderoga is filled with history. And we have to ask the question of why? Why did so much happen in this remote place? You know, why were, were people coming here and uh, making war on one another and, and traveling through the region? And my, my standby answer for uh, all questions about history, you know, what is, what's the secret here? Uh, the secret is water. My students have heard me say that over and over again. Uh, if you want to understand history, you have to understand the waterway. So let's take a look at this map. This is uh, Ticonderoga from above. And just to get your, your bearings here, the body of water on the right is Lake Champlain. You can see the New York Vermont line. There is Fort Ticonderoga, which we'll be talking a little bit about tonight. If you move from right to left, you'll see where uh, it looks like a swampy area. Follow this waterway up and you'll, you can follow the, the river through the town and eventually it makes its way connecting with Lake George. Now Lake George is that little snake looking thing in the lower left. So we have a river connecting these two bodies of water. Ticonderoga means place between the waters, Lake George and Lake Champlain. However, uh, you cannot get from one lake 
to the other simply by going through uh, this river, which is known as the La Chute. Uh, and by the way, that the red circle, that's our campus here, for those of you that aren't familiar, just to uh, get our bearings once again. If you were to travel from Lake Champlain up the La Chute River, you would run into this waterfall. This is a last, uh, the last in a series of waterfalls on that river that winds through town. So what would you do? You would have to pick up your boat and you would make a beeline the shortest way you could to Lake George. And I'm very proud of myself. I did all this, this red, uh, these red lines here. Um, let's follow this red line up the La Chute River. Right where it says Ticonderoga, between the G and the A, you can see that that line makes almost like a 90 degree angle. So this is where that waterfall is located. And you pick up your boat, you travel south, and you would, you would walk about a mile and a half over this section, which becomes known as the Portage. This road is one of the oldest roads in North America. It probably dates back uh, thousands of years. Native Americans would have used this going between the two lakes. Uh, and as you can see, uh, it crosses right over our campus. So here is the view from uh, our, one of our classroom windows and that is the waterfall we're talking about. And we'll talk more about this area coming up, but really my presentation is gonna focus on all the history that happened right here. Uh, panning to the left, that's a shot taken toward the village. And I used another red line here. That is the portage. That's the actual route that uh, was traversed for uh, centuries, millennia even. So we know how to get from Lake George to Lake Champlain and vice versa. Big deal. Um, why is that so important? We still don't know why people were coming here. To understand that, it still relies on water. So let's uh, pull back and we'll look at the waterways of the region. So uh, this is a satellite map, obviously, and you can see the St. Lawrence River from uh, the top center of the screen moving diagonally out to the Great Lakes. And if you wanted to travel south, uh, there is really only one way to do it. And it's through this waterway right here. Uh, to the, you can see Lake Champlain in the upper right of the screen. Uh, to the west, the Adirondacks, you're not traveling through there. Uh, to the east, you have the Green and White Mountains, you're not going to travel through there. But uh, nature has provided a perfect waterway almost due north south. So if you wanted to travel south, and by the way, uh, before there were roads, everybody traveled by water. So that's, that's, that's the importance of the waterways. So let's take a boat from uh, the northern end of Lake Champlain and we're gonna go south to New York City. So you have a hundred miles of open water on Lake Champlain, a hundred miles you could travel. And when you reach Ticonderoga, you would make that little portage that I just, uh, we just zoomed in on. And then you would put your boat into Lake George. Once you got into Lake George, you've got 32 miles of open water, uh, almost due south. And at that point, you pick up your boat, you ca carry it overland, and you get to the Hudson River. I'm actually, I've outlined it here. Yeah, I know it looks like a third grader did this, but this is the best I could do, but you get the idea. Um, the arrow in the circle is that link where Ticonderoga is located. So anyone using this north-south route has to come right through this portage, which explains why, you know, nations began fortifying this region, trying to protect um, their land either north or south. And we're gonna talk about that uh, in just a bit. So hopefully that, that gives you a sense of why Ticonderoga is so crucial. The first European to visit uh, the waterfalls across the street here was Samuel de Champlain. He comes down in 1609 and he is, um, traveling with a group of Native Americans that were allied with the French. And he comes, joins them on a war party. And they have a, a small skirmish here about a mile away. And Champlain talks about walking, following the Lachute River up to this set of falls. So he would have been the first European to set foot uh, on these grounds. But the major events occur beginning in the 1750s. French and Indian War. Now the French and Indian War is a global conflict. It's a, it was really the first world war 
and it's known as the Seven Years War, sort of in that big scope. Um, but the fighting here in North America is known as the French and Indian War, and it is extremely easy to understand. And to kind of start that out, uh, let's go to the roots of it. So here we have a, I love this map, I've used this map for years. It is um, very early colonies of European nations. So we can see the French color-coded in green settling up along the St. Lawrence. We've got the English settling along the seacoast, places like Plymouth and Jamestown, and of course the Spanish to the south, but they were more uh, Central America and out west. So uh, the two nations that we're gonna be concerned with are uh, Britain and France. And in 1650, it was uh, no problem, plenty of elbow room. However, let's fast forward a century and now look at this map. So all of this blue that you see is part of New France, so the, the French colony. Um, the red along the seacoast is uh, the British colonies. Now this map is a little bit deceiving because despite the fact that you have this huge area, there are only about 100,000 uh, French people here, mostly settled along up by Montreal, Quebec. And note the shape of their, uh, their colony. It encompasses all of these waterways. They had established a very lucrative fur trade with the Native Americans and that uh, the, those were the, the ways you uh, ship goods. But if you look at the red section, the British colonies by 1750 have a population of over 1 million and they're rapidly uh, expanding here. So we've reached critical mass. We have to expand and the only way to go is to go west. In other words, encroach onto that blue section and the French are not happy with this. So uh, this sparks off the French and Indian War. So right away, the British and the French begin to fortify strategic locations. And these are all connected with waterways, notice. And if you look sort of in the lower center of the screen, you see Fort Carillon Ticonderoga. That is the French name of Fort Ticonderoga, which is located uh, probably a mile um, to the east of where I am right now. I'm on the Thai campus. And the British are gonna build Fort William Henry at the other end of Lake George. So the lines have been drawn and, and notice this map. These, this, these are international boundaries now. So uh, the border between the French and the British is literally Ticonderoga. We are the frontier. And in order to protect uh, either waterway, whichever you're going, uh, you have to hold on to Ticonderoga. It's been called the key to the continent. Uh, this is another uh, 18th century map which shows uh, the ground that we're talking about. Uh, that yellowish rectangle is roughly where our campus building stands. Letter A shows the waterfall and letter B is that portage road which goes from the falls over to Lake George. And here's just a, an aerial view just to give you a little bit of uh, bearings here. A is the falls and B is the portage. We'll talk more about the portage later. Yes, Daniel Day Lewis, way before he became Lincoln. Uh, the last of the Mohegans uh, tells the story of the siege of Fort William Henry. And that story begins right here at the waterfalls in Ticonderoga. Essentially, um, if you can think back to that map, Lake George is controlled at the northern end by the French and by the at the southern end by the British and the French wanna change that. They're gonna to put together about 10,000 men and they will move south on Lake George and try to capture and destroy Fort William Henry. And the place that they begin to amass these, uh, this group is right here at the waterfalls using that portage. So uh, these, when you look at history and events, major events like this, sometimes it, we get the sense that they were so easy. You just see maps and arrows pointing in different directions. Uh, but these were difficult, uh, grueling uh, things to do. And we have to get a, you know, get a sense of what it was like at that time. You've got thousands of men in wool uniforms in the summer heat. You've got the filth of, of animals. You've got bodily waste. Um, 
If you've ever gone camping with a small group of people, you know what a mess you can make of a campsite in a weekend. So think about 10,000 people camped around the falls. We have a uh, account from a French officer, his name was Bougainville. And he had an incredible eye for detail that he recorded uh, such minute things. Uh, but he also gives us a sense of what's going on here at the falls in, in July of 1757, as this army is beginning to amass, uh, waiting to go and strike south down Lake George. He writes, people cannot appreciate in Europe the merit of operations carried out in America. The hardships cannot be imagined and it is impossible to give a fair idea of it. On July 18th, he writes, for 10 days, the men have been working to get up the portage over to Lake George. Uh, the boats needed to carry the troops, munitions, provisions, and artillery. The carry is long and difficult. Everything is hauled by hand. It is not that there are no oxen or horses here, but that there is nothing to feed them with. And lacking nourishment, they have not enough strength to do their job. So here's where that portage uh, becomes important. And it had been used for centuries. It's a well-worn path, but it was really a footpath because uh, people were carrying canoes. Now we need to carry these huge uh, whale boats, essentially, with wagons and artillery and uh, kegs of provisions. So um, there's a tremendous amount of effort going into improving the portage, cutting down trees, hauling these boats over. By July 19th, Bougainville says that 160 boats have been hauled over the portage of the 250 that would be needed. Uh, it then began to rain heavily, turning everything to this slick mud. So uh, grueling indeed, Bougainville talks about the hardships. But when we think about the encampment at the falls, we, we really need to use our imagination. Uh, this would have been a sight to see. You have uh, a whole mix of people. You've got French soldiers with their uh, really fancy and elaborate uniforms. You've got Canadian militia. You have uh, bright white tents with fluttering regimental flags and fife and drum music. Um, you also have almost 2,000 Indian allies who would come to take part in this, some from as far away as the Great Lakes. Uh, so uh, they're here and they're negotiating with General Montcalm, the French officer. So uh, use your imagination to try to picture that. There's also activity happening. Although uh, this is the base camp and the armies are getting ready to make their move, uh, both sides, the French and the British are sending out feelers and there's scouting parties that are running into each other in the woods and shots are being fired. And at one point, a group of French soldiers is returning to their tent across the street here at the sawmill and shots ring out. And it was a group of um, Iroquois or Mohawk Indians that had uh, crept as close as this camp. They were fighting for the British. They uh, ambushed this group. They scalped one of the French soldiers. So the fighting is, is getting close, even though the attack is going to be away. Um, Bougainville also leaves us a couple disturbing images. And I'm just going to read his words uh, for what they're worth. Um, on July 28th, he writes, in Eng and this, again, would have been right across the street here. July 28th, an English corpse came floating by the Indians' camp. They crowded around it with loud cries, drank its blood, and put its pieces in the kettle. However, it was only the Western Indians who committed these cruelties. Our domesticated ones took no part in it. They spent all day in confession. So um, one thing to note, Many times when you read European accounts of Native Americans, there's a disconnect, especially culturally, and uh, something is lost in translation. Um, but I have no doubt that there were atrocities being committed. Um, it, it was just the way of warfare during these days. So there's a little uh, vignette of some of the things that were happening here. In August, the French move out and the campaign is a success. They destroy Fort William Henry, and then they return back here to Ticonderoga. And they, the, the French soldiers don't stay here. They are usually sent back up to Canada or, or even back to France. So over the winter, this is kind of a quiet place. Uh, that all changes in the summer of 1758. And um, what's going to happen here is 
and are going to make 1757 really pale in comparison. And what I'm about to say may surprise a lot of you, and you're not alone. Uh, the bloodiest battle fought in North America before our own civil war was fought right where I'm sitting, Ticonderoga. Uh, and not a lot of people know about that. So uh, let me give you just a brief overview and give you some of the activity that took place right here on the grounds because uh, this, this area played a crucial role in that battle as well. Summer of 1758, the British decide that they will move north on Lake George, like the French had moved south the year before, and they're going to punch through Ticonderoga, get access to Lake Champlain, and then eventually up to Canada. They will amass an army of 16,000 men. This is the biggest army ever amassed on the continent. It's, it's comprised of roughly half British soldiers from overseas and half American soldiers raised right here in the colonies. Remember, we were still a British colony, so you've got American soldiers fighting alongside the British. Now, in early July, what a beautiful picture, huh? Uh, in early July, uh, French soldiers were, as usual, using these mountaintops to scout looking south. Now, this is looking off of Rogers Rock down Lake George. And one day they would look down the lake and see this. Now, if you can make this out, all these little dots on the lake are boats. This is that flotilla that had been assembled to carry these 16,000 troops and all of their munitions and supplies up the lake. This flotilla stretched for six miles. So next time when you're driving on a highway or somewhere, you know, look, take a look at how long six miles is. Uh, that's, that's what the French see coming at them. Uh, would have been a, a really a sight to behold. At that point, Let's move back to the fall. So hopefully this, this image is becoming, this pattern is becoming familiar to you. Uh, we've got the orange rectangle where the campus is. We had French soldiers camped all over these grounds and they were sort of guarding the portage. As these 16,000 men begin to arrive, uh, the French have to make a decision. They only have about 3,600 men to defend and there's nobody coming. So what they will do is they will uh, withdraw. And if you can see on the right of the screen, Fort Carrion, this is uh, Fort Ticonderoga. And on that peninsula, they would construct very hastily a, a log wall. They would cut down trees and stack these logs uh, one on top of another about 10 feet high. And that's where they're going to make their stand. On July 7th, the British start to move and they come over the portage and they start to camp right here on these grounds, 16,000 men. So uh, here's a little uh, mind blowing fact. I think it's mind blowing. Uh, for one day in 1758, Ticonderoga was the most densely populated area in North America, or at least what would become the United States and Canada. Uh, you had more camped in Ticonderoga than the populations of Boston, Philadelphia, or New York City. Um, so it's tough to get your head around that, especially uh, looking at the ground today. So this is going to be the staging area for the attack. And this attack that occurs on July 8th is a very simple and a very sad story. Uh, there is not a lot of thought or strategy that goes into it. Um, the British command orders a direct frontal assault. And what that means is you line your men up in long rows and you say, go forward. And for eight hours, um, line after line goes up to that log wall and is just blown away. Uh, there's not even a, a chance of victory here. So we do have an account written by a Massachusetts soldier and he's a really good uh, writer as well. And he gives us a little bit of uh, what that was like that day uh, going against those lines. He said, the fight came on very smart. It held for about eight hours, a soreful sight to behold. The dead men and wounded lay on the ground, the wounded having some of their legs and other limbs broken, others shot through the body and mortally wounded. 
to hear their cries and see their bodies laying in blood as the earth trembled with the fire of small arms was as mournful sight as I ever saw. So this, just a little glimpse into the horror of what these guys experienced. And after eight hours, the, the battle was over. The British withdrew back to this site, back to the falls. And the British general in charge of this was uh, named Abercrombie. And he wrote a letter home describing this battle. And one line, as I was putting this presentation, really kind of stuck out to me. He says that the broken remains of my army did so far rally as to remain that night with me at an advantageous spot of ground near the sawmill. Uh, and that's the line that kind of uh, stuck out to me. If you look at this terrain in a military sense, that advantageous ground could only be this hill where I'm sitting right now, where the campus is located. Like it's high ground, it would have protected the retreat route up the portage. Um, and I think this was the rallying point for the British Army. Now, a lot of soldiers, um, when they talk about battle, uh, you often hear them say that the time waiting to go in and the time after the battle are even worse than the fighting itself. And uh, I can't imagine, I don't think uh, words could describe the aftermath of this particular battle. In just eight hours, there were over 3,000 casualties in a single day. Uh, 25 of them, tw excuse me, 2,500 of them were on the British side. So we, we have a couple, uh, a few accounts here that kind of describe the aftermath. And of course the falls being this fallback position, I'm sure there were makeshift hospitals, uh, men groaning, men dying. Uh, Massachusetts soldier, David Perry. Uh, we got away the wounded of our company, but left a great many crying for help. None of those that were left behind were ever heard of afterwards. Joshua Goodenough, the army was utterly demoralized and made a headlong retreat during which many wounded men were left to die in the woods. Uh, another Massachusetts soldier came back from the battle uh, to the falls here and he says he collapsed, he was so exhausted. He wakes up in the middle of the night and says, we looked around and found that the army was chiefly gone. We marched after them and passed by wounded men all the way. So he's talking about this ground to Lake George up the port. It's talking about wounded men throughout. The day after the battle, the French um, come out from behind their lines and they uh, survey the aftermath and it's uh, just gruesome sights. One French soldier says, wounded, provisions, abandoned equipment, shoes left in miry places, remains of barges and burned pontoons. We found in the mud on the road to the falls more than 500 pairs of shoes with buckles, which strongly indicated the precipitancy of their flight. Uh, on that day, the French began to collect the dead and one French officer said that they gathered up 800 bodies and put them in a single trench. Those men are still there today up not near the French lines. And just knowing the conditions of this the period, I would be shocked, and I have no evidence, but I would be shocked if there were not burials on this ground today. Uh, in fact, 1898, about 200 yards south of where I'm sitting right now, there were workers digging a trench and they found a, a skeleton, a body from the battle. 1924, there were some town workers uh, working on a road and they dug up 18 more that were uh, buried from this battle. There was no Keep in mind, the enemy is burying the dead. They're not gonna mark the graves. Even if they wanted to, they wouldn't know who they were. And over time, they just get lost. So uh, in many ways, I consider this uh, hallowed ground. So the French and Indian War, just to wrap it up, it's, it, it's over by 1760 and uh, the British win, okay? And the result of that is this big, um, addition of extra land. So you can see this section that says ceded the green and white. All of this, which was previously French territory, now belongs to the British. So what that means for us is Ticonderoga. We are now in the middle of uh, nowhere. You know, this is no longer the frontier. It's no longer strategic. Uh, but we know that's going to change. And in 1775, Ticonderoga suddenly becomes important once again for the same reasons it was important earlier, through that strategic uh, 
a place along the waterways to control what's going north and south. So as we look at our ground here on the campus, um, one of the big events that's going to happen in 1775 is Henry Knox will arrive. Henry Knox is a really interesting guy. He is about, I wanna say he's 24 or 25 years old. So, you know, a lot of our students think of how old they are. He is sent here by George Washington himself and he will amass 60 tons of artillery. He'll strap them on the wagons and he'll haul them from Ticonderoga down to Boston in just over a month. Um, and those guns will be used to drive the British out of that city. And this is a, a great painting called The Noble Train of Artillery. And uh, it's a little dramatic. Uh, that's the Portage Road. It's definitely not that steep, uh, but it does give a good indication of you know, how uh, these pieces of artillery were moved. And you can see uh, Ticon Fort Ticonderoga in the background. Another visitor in 1776, we know Benjamin Franklin. He is traveling north with uh, another member of Congress, Charles Carroll, another signer of the Declaration of Independence. They're headed to Canada to try to get some support for the revolution. Now, Franklin is traveling in a rowboat up Lake George in April. He, they talk about having to break through the ice so they can get through. Uh, Franklin is 70 years old at the time, and he's at one point thinks he's not going to survive this trip. And he starts writing letters home, uh, dear so-and-so, it was great to know you, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but he, we know that he does survive. And uh, he would make his way across our front lawn here along with Charles Carroll. Uh, and they report that the portage is just buzzing with activity. And we'll see a little bit more why in uh, just a minute here. In 1777, we have uh, probably the biggest military action here and it is the campaign of John Burgoyne. Now, John Burgoyne has come up with a plan where he will make several strikes through New York State and capture Albany. And this is uh, kind of a simple version of it. You can see that these uh, groups of British soldiers will move from different directions. His idea is if you capture Albany, you can cut off New York from all of us troublemakers in New England that started this. So. Uh, and look at the waterways. This is the way uh, that these armies are going to travel. When he arrives here in July of 1777, Ticonderoga has been heavily fortified. There have been uh, a great number of defenses built uh, besides the original fort. Now keep in mind, when the French built the fort at Ticonderoga, the threat was to the south. So all of the guns, all of the, the best views were to the south. In the revolution, it's the opposite. If the British attack, they're going to be coming down from the north. So if you see um, letter B on the map, that is Fort Ticonderoga. The Americans would move over to Vermont and you'll see a peninsula with the letter A. That is going to be stripped of trees and fortified because it has that view to the north. That is called Mount Independence. Uh, moving over to the lower left, C is our campus and D is Mount Hope, which I'll talk about in just a minute. And if you look um, lower center screen, you'll see um, a terrain that indicates a mountain. This is Mount Defiance, which is right behind our campus here. And this is the view if you get to Mount Defiance, you can still uh, hike it or drive most of it today. And this is looking uh, west into Vermont and there is Mount Independence. And there was a bridge connecting Fort Ticonderoga and Mount Independence. So keep this view in mind. I'm gonna refer to it in just a couple of minutes. But Mount Hope was built on the other side of the waterfalls. And the idea for that fortification was to defend the portage and any threat from the north. And once again, this is looking out of our classroom windows. Uh, that is Mount Hope right there, right on the other, other bank. So uh, it is still, some of it is preserved today. A, a section of it is a cemetery uh, for some reason but there are defenses you can go up and, and you can walk around and see what that was like. When John Burgoyne arrives here, he has about 9,000 men. They're moving north to south, again, with the idea of smashing through the defenses of Ticonderoga, uh, which is going to be very easily done. Uh, during the summer, there were not enough American soldiers to defend both sides of the lake. 
And one of the tactics that Burgoyne uses, and it's kind of become, you know, legendary, is uh, he has guns hauled to the top of Mount Defiance. That view that we just saw, uh, he figures if they put guns up there, they can bombard the fort. Uh, and those guns were uh, brought right to this spot and the road to the top of Mount Defiance uh, began right here at our uh, campus parking lot. And within a day, those guns were hauled up by hand, but the Americans, uh, they were looking to get the heck out of there before they were captured. So the guns weren't even used and they were driven south to fight another day. And that, that brings an end to the military history here at Ticonderoga um, in the Falls area. But we're gonna have some important visitors that uh, make their way through here. George Washington, 1783, uh, he's still a commander of the Continental Army. The war is, is pretty much over though, he's downstate. And uh, by all indications, this was really kind of a vacation. He wanted to get away. He's uh, tired of all the paperwork and bickering among his commanders. And he would come up Lake George uh, through the portage. He would cross over our front lawn here and tour the defenses of Ticonderoga. 1791, two more prominent visitors, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. They were uh, really good friends from Virginia and they're taking a tour of the North country. And Jefferson loved nature and he wrote a lot of descriptions of Lake George. And one of those quotes you may have seen on a t-shirt or a mug or a bumper sticker, uh, especially around this area, it's been used to promote tourism. Uh, this is Jefferson's quote. Lake George is without comparison, the most beautiful water I ever saw. Uh, what he also wrote and what you don't see is this. Rattlesnakes abound on its borders. It is infested with swarms of mosquitoes and gnats and two kinds of biting fleas. So I'd like to see that put on a t-shirt someday. Um, Madison and Jefferson spend the night in, uh, on the fort grounds actually, and then make their way through Vermont and then south. Which brings us to the next layer of history here, uh, industry. And a lot of this portion will we're gonna be using photographs and I tried to go out and get a modern day view so we can compare them. Now the industrial revolution begins in America in late 18th century, early 19th century. And the early part of it, uh, it was water that was driving factories and mills and Ticonderoga is ideally suited for that. Um, what you're looking at here is the Thai pulp and paper mill. And this was, if if we looked out our window today, those views I've been showing you, this is what we would have seen. Uh, this is a modern view across the street. And uh, sort of the giveaway here is Mount Hope. If you look in the upper left of each picture, you can see the contour of Mount Hope. So that's where that stood. This is what they call a bird's eye from the 1880s. And if you look to the upper left, you will see Lake George. In the outlet of Lake George, uh, begins to drop and that it becomes the Lachute River that we've been talking about at the beginning of the presentation. We saw that winds through town. L the Lachute River drops about over 200 feet in this uh, small space. So this is ideal for industrial production. And there are about 25 mills that were located along the river. Um, just a note on these bird's eyes, uh, you've probably seen them before. This was sort of a, a a craze in the, in the late 19th century, artists would come to a town, uh, we'll be looking at Malone next week actually, and they would sketch out all of the structures and the features of the town and then they would draw it as if you were in the sky. And, and keep in mind, this is before airplanes, so this was really novel. And uh, they're incredibly detailed. So if you have an old house, you know, 1880s or earlier, and you can find a bird's eye of your town, you might actually find your house and what it looked like. Um, so it's a lot of fun. You can get lost in these things. So here is the detail of the grounds that we've been talking about. C is where the campus is located. A is the falls, obviously. And B, you can still make out the portage, even though there's been a railroad track that's disturbed it a little to the south, the beginning of that portage still exists. And what really uh, helps Ticonderoga economically is the opening of the Champlain Canal in 1823. So if you had goods from Ticonderoga, you could put them on a boat 
Uh, you could go south on Lake Champlain through the canal and connect with the Hudson. So you could go to markets in Albany and New York City. Uh, if you went north, you could go up through another canal and connect with the St. Lawrence River. So Ticonderoga is connected to the world at this point. Uh, a number of changes were made. They, they dredged the Lachute River. So uh, barge uh, canal boats could get in. So I wanna draw your attention to one portion of this bird's eye view, and it is the letter D. What that shows is a stack of, or several stacks of wood either being, uh, waiting to be processed or waiting to be taken away, I, I'm not sure. But not only do we have this view, but at some point, a photographer set up his camera on that little island just below where it says D, and he took a photograph in the general, uh, generally the same direction. This is that photograph. So uh, actually, look, sorry for going back and forth. Let me uh, point out one more thing. Look in the lower left-hand corner, you'll see a, a white building. And right in front of that, you will see one of those canal boats. And uh, here we see the, the boats similar to in that picture. But not only did he capture this stack of wood, he captures probably for the first time on film, the campus grounds, which is letter A. And I also, uh, see the original portage, that little dip in the ground, letter B. So these, these photographs are so much fun. I encourage you, if you uh, have some time, go on to the Library of Congress website or just Google historic photographs for your town and you can pull up a lot of these pictures and they're, a lot of times they're um, submitted in high resolution and the detail is just incredible. So let's, let's look at some of these photographs now. Uh, this is a modern view I, I took actually yesterday, uh, looking at that same area. The waterfall was what they would say improved back in the 19th century. The southern half of the fall that we've been talking about across the street was dammed up. And you can see that pipes diverted the water straight into the mill to maximize the power they could get out of it. I went uh, tramping through the snow and uh, I didn't expect to find anything and I couldn't believe it, but that dam is still there and those pipes are still sticking out of the wall. So there's a, a then and now. Uh, the water has been diverted. So the dam doesn't actually function as a dam, but it, it, the stonework is still there. And if you note that brick building in the back, that is present in both photographs. It is the last building standing of all the mill operations and today it's known as the Heritage Museum, uh, and you can visit it. Another view, and again, um, just the industrialization that had taken over Ticonderoga. And if we zoom in, we've got another little detail that you probably miss. There's either two workers or two kids playing in a log pile there on the lower left. And uh, of course, in the background, we have our hill again, and it looks like a big pile of, of logs. And that was, as close as I could get to duplicating that shot there. Uh, this is a great photograph for detail. And this was taken just on the opposite bank looking south. It just shows, again, the industrialization of the Lachute River, which had been so important to history. It's almost uh, obliterated here. And the view today, and it was again that heritage museum building that helped me line up this shot. You can, I circled it in both. So you can see even the, the water itself, the contours of the water are still the same. In the 1870s, the railroad came to tie. And this added another possibility for transporting goods, but it also uh, fueled this mill. And this trestle was built right up to the waterfall and it would carry coal that it could dump into the hoppers of the mill to, to, to work the engines. Uh, this is the Delaware and Hudson, I believe. And there's another great shot of that railroad trestle going right up to the mill itself. And there's the, the view that we see today with our campus building on the right. Uh, there was a storehouse across the street directly in front of our uh, roadway uh, entering the campus and some mill buildings, obviously, and some smokestacks behind it. 
those are all gone and that is the modern view today. So we've just got a couple more pictures here. A little bit more of the uh, log piles which had now spread to the other side of the river. Uh, this is the rail coming in 1906, the rail beds. And this was kind of a little bit of an adventure trying to find this. Uh, nature has reclaimed it. And you'll have to take my word for it. The road, bed, the road, road beds are very visible. I put red lines here so to help you out. But um, just another example of the way the industrial age kind of really altered the landscape here. And I love this shot. This is an aerial view from 1945. Uh, the rectangle lower left is the campus building. You can see there's a train track right there, uh, but just the, the industry <laughs> that literally reeks from this picture. And I mean that because uh, if you ever smell the paper mill, this was a chemical mill, which was infusing chemicals into the paper and it, uh, it, it, the smell is awful. So in 1925, International Paper purchased uh, the mill operation at the Lower Falls, and they would expand their operation around the area. And they would be here until 1969, when they would move onto the shores of Lake Champlain and donate the ground back to the town. And the town did an amazing job of reclaiming this. Here's a picture from 1975, uh, the demolition taking place. I've highlighted the Heritage Building which hopefully becomes familiar in our campus location on the right, that other rectangle. Uh, this is where that storehouse was. I uh, love the 70s, the hat and the leather jacket. Um, this is some of the cleanup operations that were occurring there. You can see the falls in the background. By the 80s, it had looked a little bit more like Washington and Champlain would have seen. Grass has been planted. Uh, most of the buildings had been demolished and it was renamed Bicentennial Park. So that's the site of the mill right there. You can uh, walk around today and there's waysides that tell of the history. We even have an old covered bridge, or is it? Actually, uh, this is a bridge in disguise. When they were uh, restoring the landscape, back to this 1945 picture, there was a railroad trestle that crossed the La Chute. So rather than tear that down, they decided to repurpose it and if you go inside, you can see the steel or the iron frame, and they just built the wood section over it to look like a, an old covered bridge. So it fits in nicely. And 2005, North Country built uh, the awesome campus here. We love it, students love it. Another view uh, overlooking what was that pulp mill. So um, I'm gonna wrap it up here, but I wanna just tell one more quick story because it's, it's fitting. In the early 2000s, there was a tourism company that had a brand new uh, tour boat built called the Adirondack. Here it is. And uh, this was a massive ship. It's 115 feet long. And it was built off site. So the question was, how do we get this huge ship onto the waters of Lake George? Uh, and the answer was pretty simple. It was sailed up Lake Champlain, it was hauled out, and it was portaged uh, using some of the original portage road, the last leg, and then it was launched into Lake George. So I thought this was kind of a, a neat way to end because it kind of brings things full circle. So hope you enjoyed it. And if you have questions, I can do my best to try to answer them. Looks like Joe Keegan, you have a question. Me clapping. Um, oh, oh, <laughs> that was awesome. That was, that was a great presentation, Tom. Thank you so much. Thank you. I do see a number of questions in the chat, however. Yeah, Tom, I'll, I'll read one um, to you and I echo what Joe said. <laughs> great job. Thanks. So, so uh, well delivered too. Um, Kim Duffy asked, have they improved the road up through the back of town to Mount Defiance? It was awful and poorly marked a few years back. And I kind of want to add on to that. Are there any, you know, existing remnants of, you know, the military encampment that was up there today that you can go see for people that might not be 
knowledgeable of the area? Um, the answer is yes and yes. The uh, Fort Ticonderoga Association actually owns the section of Mount Hope that's preserved and Mount Defiance. And there is a paved road to the top. I believe, um, I believe you have to purchase a ticket to get up there, but you can drive to the top or you can just walk to the top. And on both of those locations, there's historic markers. Uh, there's actually cannon on top of Mount Defiance, which is pretty cool. Uh, and the view itself is just beautiful. You can see for miles uh, over into Vermont. So there's there's lots of um, there's lots of lots of historical uh, markers here to tell the history. That's great. Um, another question from David. He asked if you could recommend any books about the French and Indian Wars, history and historical fiction. Um, he said he's read Kenneth Roberts and uh, James Fenimore Cooper, of course. Any uh, uh, any recommendations? Yes, the best the best uh, writer on the French and Indian War, as a whole, is uh, Fred Anderson. And the Crucible of War is a is a, one of those really thick books, and it talks about the global conflict. And he also did a shorter version that you can find, and it's I think it focuses on the French and Indian War. So both of those are really good. And I will say, if anybody wants to unmute and ask a question, you, you can too as well. We've got a small enough group here. I, I'll ask one in the, in the sort of interim here. The, the Portage Road that you've talked about, um, you know, what is left of it today that, it, and, you know, it, can you go out and see it in any, you know, way that is one, showing anything like what it may have been during, any, you know, some of the different eras that you spoke of? And two, is it interpreted? You know, is it marked? You know, is it, can people find a place where, you know, there's a, you know, the good sort of, a little bit of an educational experience and a designation of what all the great history that happened because of that? Uh, boy, I didn't want to go off the rails on this one. Um, I'll try to control myself. But uh, to answer your question, there are, there's a, a several markers along the road. The road today is still called the Portage. And from here, uh, the original portage picks up about halfway as you go, in other words, from, from Lake George about halfway here, it's the original road and it's since been diverted. Um, I, I will mention this because I think it's important. Um, that original entrance to the portage that I showed you photographs of, and if you remember the bird's eye view, you can still see that it was undisturbed. Uh, that was undisturbed until about two years ago when I came to work and I saw um, backhoes and bulldozers digging holes in the ground on the original portage. Um, I contacted the state and their answer was that surveys were done and I know they weren't because I'm here every day. They showed me pictures, but they were pictures taken across the street. Uh, you could literally see in the grass, the roadbed. You could literally see where it had been tramped down. It was exactly the same width and uh, the answer was, well, it just, there's a monument there that marks it. And I, I even said to the, the state history department that it, there's a marker there. And they said, well, we think that marks a general area where it was and not the exact. Uh, and Brian O'Connor, who was with us, sent me the dedication of that monument. And it specifically states that this is the exact spot and we're putting it here so people know that and don't mess it up in the future. So um, I wanted to take a picture of this for the presentation. And uh, what they did is they, they dug a hole for a drainage basin. They put a bunch of boulders in. There's a telephone pole, a power line right in it with a Sunoco bumper sticker on it. And I said, eh, we'll just use our imagination. So uh, some of it is preserved, but that was a shame. And it, I was really upset when it happened. Well, unbelievable. Kim, ha Kim has a question. Go ahead, Kim. Can, um, can Tom, is there, so I've, I spent a few different trips taking family members who are army people and Navy people and whatever. All right. So I love this area so much. Is there something that, um, and I'm a member of the Fort Ticonderoga, uh, whatever. Um, is there something that we can do uh, partnering with North Country 
to uh, illuminate and to push this anything from historical markers to wayfinding signs. I was very impressed at Fort Edward when I stopped there with my husband a few years back and we had a little lunch and we kind of hung out and got out of the car and walked around and read all these fabulous historical little markers that are dotted around the landscape there up above uh, above the lake and all the cruisy ships. Um, can we get going on that? I mean, I got, I got about 10 people in my family who love Fort Ticonderoga with all their heart. They just, my kid who's in Iraq right now, we couldn't get him off the top of Mount Defiance. It was just like he's standing <laughs> on a rock. Yeah. looking out and he's planning the next battle and he's overstanding in the fort in the fort at Ticonderoga there's that 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 plaque that says through this portal has marched George Washington you know like there's a whole like my kid's like what yeah I took a picture of him I'm like you stand <laughs> here he's like you're stupid mom I'm like stand <laughs> here you know maybe you'll be a general someday um whatever is there something we can do as a college? Because I'd love to get behind it and make that donation to do wayfindings, to do more of a Fort Edward kind of a deal. Because I was very disappointed, like I said, that crappy road up to the top of Defiance and uh, you know, trying to, it just, I'm like, what, what, what are we doing here? Like, and now the college, that's our anchor. Like that's our Southern anchor. If you're a historian and you're brilliant, man, oh my God, like you're, you're great. And I'm, I'm a historian myself. So that's like kind of, and it's not saying praise. So what can <laughs> we do? What can we take from this to make it better? Right. Like to, from wayfinding to whatever I'm done. Well, you know, uh, Selena and I have talked in the past about, you know, what can we do during the summer that might be a good activity. And, you know, we, we're kind of throwing around the idea that we'd love to do like a historical tour based out of uh, North Country. You know, people would purchase a ticket or whatever or stay at the hotel overnight. It could be two days. And so many people think that historical events happen like in historical parks or when you go through the gate at Fort Ticonderoga, that's when the history begins. But really, uh, it's all over the place. And we could kind of highlight a lot of these areas and talk about the history that happened there. So uh, that was one idea that we had, we had floated around. So I would, I'd be on board with that, absolutely. That's great. Tom, I, don't, I didn't see any other questions, but if anybody uh, has one, obviously you can feel free to unmute and, and ask, and if not, um... We can wrap it up. You're getting a lot of accolades here in the chat, Tom. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Super interesting material and engaging speaker. Thanks, Sir Tom. <laughs> I've been Stacey. <laughs> and uh, a lot of other uh, folks. Thanks. Well, well, thank you. Thanks for sticking through. Yeah. So next week, we'll do uh, Malone. That sounds great. I don't think anybody's going to get killed up there, though. So it'll be a little different <laughs> talk. <laughs> Is that a teaser or a spoiler? I alert? don't know. <laughs> hey, Tom, there's a lot of dead people in my backyard. So, uh, <laughs> okay. you know, like in Shattagay. So 1812. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be another presentation. Yeah. Maybe no wars killed them, but um, I'm sure some there was some flooding. Uh, yeah. No, no, this was wars. They were they were bivouacked right here in Shattagay. We got like 18 historical markers from 1812. But I'll leave that to Tom because I'm not drilling down on that. Yeah, I'd like <laughs> to learn more. Come on up. Okay. We got we got, we got um, some local historians and we had a historical society and we got the 1812 guys are buried right up the street um, in the cemeteries there. And there's lots of cows and very good cheese. <laughs> okay. Cool. Say hi to Robin for me. Okay. Thank you very much. It was wonderful. Yeah. Thanks. Last call for questions. 
All right. Well, thank you, Tom, so much for your wonderful presentation and sharing your immense knowledge. Uh, it was just a, it was just a pleasure to to once again listen to one of your presentations. And I hope that next week people will consider joining us as we as Tom uh, talks about talks about our Malone campus and all of the wonderful things that happened there. We also have some great presentations coming up in March and April. In March, we're going to be looking at managing the high peaks um, and managing the recreation. We're also going to look to at the threats of the Adirondack water quality and climate change. And then in April, we'll be moving more towards backcountry preparedness, why we garden, and all about birds. So please tell your friends. Please consider you know, joining us. And again, one special thanks to our own marketing and enrollment program. I'd like to thank the North Country Foundation. And of course, again, thanking International Paper of Ticonderoga for sponsoring these great programs. So thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. And Tom, wonderful job. Thank Selena. you. Thanks, everyone. Selena, can you hear me? I'm I can. Hi, Brian. Yeah. Uh, you're such a show off. That's a beautiful room. Uh, you couldn't hear me. <laughs> yeah, you couldn't hear me. You couldn't hear me applaud Tom earlier. Uh, that was magnificent, Tom. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. And thanks for your help. Yeah. Every time I wanted to convince you, you bring up exactly what I was waiting for. <laughs> well done. <man. laughs> All right. And one other thing I would like to add that this has been recorded. So if you would like to listen to it again, or if you have friends or family that you think might enjoy this presentation, please have them come and visit our North Country Live page and they can watch this at their convenience. Awesome. Have a good evening, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Thank Tom. You. Thanks, Selena. Thank you guys. Thanks, Thanks for Tom. coming, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. See, see you next right. week. All right. Looking forward to it.